Okay, you guys ready? You ready? Those of you in the third row, are you guys ready to yes. get started? <laughs> What's the simplest machine you can think of? The simplest machine you can think of? A netbook, okay. Simpler. Wheel. I like wheels. Simpler. A rock. <laughs> In the right hands, a rock is... It. So a machine is something that, that transforms one thing into another. A machine is something that transforms one thing into a rock. <laughs> Does work, yes. So it could turn a melon into mush, yeah, or something like that. That's what made the wheel was a rock. I think the simplest machine I've seen defined as a machine is the inclined plane, which is a really cool little device that turns when you push something sideways, it goes up. If you take an inclined plane and you wrap it around the cone, it turns into a screw, and it does all sorts of cool things. Most machines transform one thing into another thing, and that's all they do. Now with software, we've got the coolest machine on the planet, because not only can software transform one kind of information into another kind of information, like, oh, for example, if you transform a whole bunch of sales data into the answer, am I profitable or not? Or what was the name of that, that uh, machine that was on Jeopardy? Uh, the one Jeopardy, Watson or something like that from mm -hmm. IBM? Yeah, it was a supercomputer that went on Jeopardy and was able to answer questions about anything faster than a human could. Software is just a machine. It's not anything to be concerned about or afraid. The big thing about it is it's complicated. Software is incredibly complicated. So for example, uh, this, this iPhone here. Probably, how many parts do you think is in an iPhone? So a thousand, probably. Just on the CPUs, probably a thousand transistors. Well, let's just think about that, that, teenage, that, that teenage Chinese person who's assembling your iPhone. How many? <laughs> How many parts does she have to actually put together? And if she had to put a thousand together, it would be. she probably jumped off the building. Probably five or six. Five yeah. or six sub-assemblies. They probably buy a, a, a chunk from here and another chunk from there, and she assembles them. Those chunks are made up of sub-assemblies. Uh, those are made by another Chinese worker in, in Shanghai, probably. You know, these machines are handmade. People talk about how it's so bad we don't have any handmade stuff anymore. <coughs> All of our electronics are handmade. They're not made by robots, they're made by teenagers who are working very hard for long pay, for long hours for very, very long pay. Anyway, bottom line is, you think about it, how many parts in a car? If we'd stop at the electronics level, if we don't say, you know, there are parts inside an electronic. How many parts in a car? You know, you do thousands. Thousands, thousands. so like 1,000? Depends on what type of car and how big. So like a Dodge Dart from the 60s. V8, V6, four-cylinder? <laughs> Anywhere in that level. I don't think that's an order of magnitude difference. Oh, it does. Because if you got like a V8, you're going to have a minimum of 16 valves versus a four-cylinder. You're only going to have eight valves. OK, so that's the difference between eight and 16. It's not the difference between 110,000. A car probably has a couple thousand parts. Yeah, a right? couple thousand. Yeah. Okay, so when you look at a processor, and even the simplest processor, like something you find in a car, it's got hundreds of thousands of parts. Each part is a transistor. If you look at a piece of software, like Windows, in here, it has, I think at last count, upwards of 7 million parts. 7 million parts. If you think of each part as a line of code. And I, and I break it up that way because a line of code can break. It needs to be replaced. A line of code can have an error in it that needs to be fixed. So how many things can you hold in your head at one time? Try this out. Imagine in your mind the face of your mother. Just see if you can picture your mom's face in your mind. And 
then see if you can picture your dad's face or someone who was uh, similarly important to you. Can you still see your mom's face? Yeah. Okay, now imagine the person you wished was your first boyfriend or mom. Because usually that person's face is very clear to all of you. Can you still see your mom's face? <laughs> yeah. It's real hard for a brain to carry more than one thing in it at a time. Especially, it's, it's very difficult for a brain to carry two different things in its head at the same time. Two things that don't make sense when you put them together. Your brain doesn't carry them. You have to turn into a manager before you can carry two contradictory things in your head and act like they're both true. It's a manager joke. Anyway, so we are humans. We can carry maybe seven things in our head at once. And despite what people say, you don't multitask. You only think about one thing at a time. Some of us are good at switching from one thing to the next. But if you're watching television and trying to do your homework at the same time, you're either doing your homework or you're watching television. You're not doing both. And you're switching back and forth. If you're talking on a cell phone and you're driving a car, you're not driving. Either you're not driving or you're not listening. One of the two. In fact, is it worse to drive drunk over the drunk limit or is it worse to talk on a cell phone? Worse than talking on a cell phone. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't sound reasonable, but it's true. And they measure that by saying um, they give a guy a cell phone, they put him on a test track, and then they throw a little girl in front of him. And they see how fast does he stop. It's not real little girl, it's a picture. <laughs> Jeez. We may be married, but we're not cruel. <coughs> it takes you longer to stop a car when you're talking on a phone than if you're drunk and on your butt. And the hands free to kick. It doesn't help. The thing that is different is you're paying attention to the person you're talking to. And you're thinking about what they want you to think about. You're not thinking about oh, what's on the, on the road. Anymore. Especially if they're breaking up with you. Or they're telling you that something really bad is happening and it has a high emotional content. So, how in the heck are we going to ever keep 7 million parts straight in our it's just impossible. So that's the nature of the problem. If you have, uh, when I was at Tech, we had these big complicated oscilloscopes, the fastest scopes on the planet. And then uh, by way of looking at it, they had a thousand mechanical parts. They're big scopes, look at this big. A thousand mechanical parts, if you included all the things that went into the third circuit board. They had 10,000 electrical parts. And they had 10 million software. So how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, you've got to break it into pieces. So if you're going to be a programmer, you've got to think about the world in terms of, well, I'm just going to break this whole thing into one big piece, and I'm not going to think about it anymore. So for example, for that car engine, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to think, I put gas in here, I hook it up to the tranny here, and in between, I don't care. Now, a guy who wants to learn engines, a guy who's good at engines, boy, he needs to know everything about that detail. With software programming, you need to make, you're constantly just saying, I'm going to take this whole piece over here, and I'm gonna, I'm just, I don't care. I'm going to feed it stuff, it's going to give me back stuff, and it's a black box otherwise. You, you hear that phrase a lot, it's a black box. Meaning, I don't care what's inside of it. So that's the first thing you do to deal with complexity, is you break it into pieces, and you forget about as much of the system as possible. Do you care how Windows works? No. You care how the Windows work. You care where the log off button is. But the other 7 million lines of code, you don't care how they work, and you don't have to. So that's the first thing you do to deal with complexity, is break, thing up, break things up into pieces. In terms of programming, at the most primitive level, what you do is you use functions, Subroutines and objects as ways of just taking a whole bunch of complexity and saying, I don't care what happens inside here, I'm going to feed this thing something, it's going to spit out something else, and it's going to work. And I don't care how it works, it's just going to work. <coughs> you collect these things up and you hand them around and you find them in things called libraries. Library. 
This is software that other people have written that you don't have to write to get around that. Sorry about the display. These are, this is a, bu a bunch of code that somebody else has written and has tested and you can depend on. And you get to it either by treating it like just a bunch of objects or just a bunch of subroutines. Libraries, if you ever program in a Windows environment, the Windows, as far as you're concerned, is just a set of libraries. It's just a bunch of objects. There are thousands of these objects. It's not much less. So those of you who are learning Java, what's the Java library system called? Um, it's, um, utility. Java utility. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of classes yes. that you call to get strings and you call to do other things. So that Java has a huge library. So one of the skills you need as a programmer is you need to not only know how to break stuff up into these pieces, but you need to also be able to navigate and learn somebody else's language. Any programming environment is the language, the libraries, and the tool chain. You say, I'm, I'm programming in Java. Yeah, you got the language itself. The language is just a way of talking. The libraries is where everybody else has done a whole bunch of work for you. And you need to learn how to use that work. You don't need to know how it works. You don't need to know. I don't know how many lines of code there is in the Java libraries. I'll bet there's millions. I'll bet there's a million. And then the other thing is the tool chain. We'll talk about the tool chain next week. OK, so I've got this big complex thing, and I'm breaking it into pieces. I'm living off of somebody else, and I'm using their libraries. This happens all the time. It used to be when we, pro when we taught programming, we spend all our time teaching you the language. Now you need to learn how to navigate in a library. You need to know how to find something. It is very likely that someone else has already written your program for you. If you're smart, you'll just use their code. So it's like HTML. Yeah. On the W3C. Yeah. And it's more than just finding an example somewhere. It's a whole component. Correct. So in your assignment, in fact, what you're going to do is go find a chunk of JavaScript somewhere else on the net and put it in your page and make it work. So one of the essential skills is being able to find stuff that other people have written, understand that it's got a good license that you can use, and then use it. If it doesn't have a good license, if it's going to cost you money or it's going to uh, restrict your rights to publish your own software, I'd stay away. Okay, so we already got lots of moving parts, lots of complicated. Another way you deal with complexity is you draw pictures. It sounds kind of dumb, but if I draw a picture, like I did when I was in grade school, and I say, what is this? Well, what is this? It's a sombrero. No, really, what is this? Anybody? Car. It's a car. You don't care. What kind of car it is. So when I do something like this and I say, uh, what is this? You've seen this before. Unity right? relationship diagram. This can represent thousands of lines of code. This can represent a whole bunch of code. Just like this represents thousands of components, hundreds of thousands of components. A simple diagram gets it across to people so much quicker than having them wade through a whole bunch of text and try to learn things, try to see things. So, diagramming. Diagramming is essential. We, we see so much better than we do anything else. I think almost half of our brain back here is devoted to seeing. So there's a whole bunch of diagramming techniques. We're going to learn flow charting here real soon. There's another diagramming technique that's very popular called UML. Do you guys in the Java class, do you have to do any UML diagrams? No. You guys have ever taken CIS 122? What kind of diagrams did you have to do there? Flow charts. Flow charts. Do you have to do any class diagrams or anything? Think 
about diagrams, there's two reasons to do diagrams. One is the formal reason. You'll, you'll work at some shops where before you can write a line of code, they want you to draw a diagram. Visio is set up for this kind of situation where you put in a diagram and it has all sorts of data you have to put into the diagram before Visio will do it right. And then you wire things together in your diagram. And Visio will actually spit out a specification for you. Sometimes it will even get you really close to the code. This is called formal diagramming. And it has its place. More often, diagramming is good for when you're just talking to somebody. And you're like, well, I got this Fratistat here, and the, the, the Fubari has to plug it right at the Scotia right there. And they're like, what the what? And you say, oh, here, let me draw a picture. Here's a box. It connects over here. And there's another box. And then this is connected. And this is what I'm concerned about. And they're like, oh, well, of course. Fine. I'll give you your money. Problem. So there's that sketching kind of thing, where you just want to draw a quick sketch, draw a quick picture up on a whiteboard so people are with you, and people can understand you quickly. There's two reasons you diagram. One is to communicate in a formal sense. You don't see that except in the bigger companies. And one is to communicate in an informal sense. Pictures are always better than writing a bunch of code. Um, when you're in the early stages and you're trying to get people to understand what you're doing. Now, some, uh, Rod said earlier, one of the things about software is it, it's not like a building. If you want, if, I don't know if you've ever built your own house or your parents have ever built a house while you were there, but you know, it isn't until you've actually put the walls up and you put the drywall up you realize, oh, the outlets are in the wrong place. Or, oh, geez, this, this room is just wrong. We need to do this differently. <coughs> Too late, unless you've got a lot of money. With software, it's exactly the opposite problem. Everybody knows you can change software anytime you like. So they do. And you never stop changing the software. And every time you mess with something, something breaks. So software is too changeable. It is too easy to change. Change is a way of life with software. So how do you deal with change? You actually use something, one of your tools, <coughs> something called change. Control. Another thing you do is you work really hard to have clear requirements. Your business systems analysts put all that effort into those ERDs, put all that effort into those business rules. You don't mess with that. And I know I'm talking about waterfall process. You know, we talk about you do an analyst analysis and you do design and then you build. When you get to the build stage, even if you're on a two-week cycle, don't mess with your requirements. That's one of the things that you can depend on. And you, it's not going to change, at least for two weeks. One of the things that makes some kinds of things easy, like uh, woodworking. I don't know if you've ever done any woodworking. Is that anyone here? Have you ever tried to do hand chiseling? It's a real interesting thing. You should try it. You should try to learn. They give classes here. They give them at the art uh, college. Getting a feel for wood is really cool. Whether you chisel across the grain, whether you chisel with the grain, if you've got a, an edge that is really sharp, your experience is very different. The thing is, the wood itself teaches you how to work with the wood. You know, you can't drive a, a nail through a, a piece of wood that's too thin and too dry and you split the wood. The nature of the wood itself tells you what you can do with it and what you can't. Software isn't like that. There are no natural constraints. If you have a building, you've got gravity. Everybody depends on gravity. If you're building it out of wood, Wood can only hold so much um, stress. You build it wrong, it falls down. Software isn't like that. You can build pretty much anything you want, anytime you want. Most of the time it doesn't work, and you don't know why. So the lack of constraints, the lack of changes, mean that you have to pay real close attention to what is this thing supposed to do. And don't go outside. 
That's one of the things that this flowchart is going to give you. It's real clear. Just do this, then do this, then do this. You don't get creative. The more creative you are, I hate to say it, the more you let yourself indulge in freedom, the less easy it is for you to make it actually work. So that's another reason to use libraries. Libraries say, well, if you're going to use this library, you have to use it this particular way. If you're going to use wood, you have to use it this particular way. It's another good reason to use library. The last thing that makes software so hard to do is this room is full of software. In fact, this room, there's software everywhere in this room. Can you see it? Well, if you're looking at a screen, you can see the effect of software. Hear the air moving through those pipes, and that's the effect of the software. There's no way you can see the software that's making that air conditioning system. You can't see software. And the thing is, even when you see the code itself, even when you're reading the code, it's very hard to see it actually in action. Because unlike a, a regular machine, you look at a regular machine like, I don't know, the wheel, and its shape tells you pretty much what it can do. The wheel rolls, it pivots around an axis. That's what it does, and you can see that. You take a, a chunk of code, you won't know what it actually does until you run it. And when you run it, you can't see it happening. First of all, it runs so much faster than you can understand. It's happening a million times faster than you can, you can read it. Secondly, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening inside that just isn't visible. You can't diagram it either. So that's another challenge. If you're the kind of person who likes to see what they're working on, who likes to see what you're talking about, software is real hard to approach. You have to carry these mental pictures. Have you ever had a favorite book that you really love, and then someone made it into a movie, and the, the, the people they chose, the actors they chose, were just horrible? Did that ever happen to you? You never got into a book right now? I mean, I've had some books. I was a real nerd when I was a kid, as if I'm not a nerd now. And there were a couple books that got brought to the screen, and I thought, that, that's not the right guy. That's because in my head, I was carrying a mental model of who that character was. When you're doing software, you create all these mental models, all of these ideas, like your mother's face, are carried around in your only carry a few around. So even if you can create that kind of idea of what the software is doing, it still has to say something. So one of the other things you can put in your tool chain is a good editor. An editor that understands the language and that allows you to see the code and what it might do. Another thing you need to do is get your hands on a debugger. One of the things we've been using in this class is Firefox, which allows you to see inside your page, allows you to see what's happening. A debugger is a tool, is a software program, that as your code runs, it shows you the stuff that's going on. It's as close as we can get. If you've ever watched a, a science fiction movie and they show the software guy hacking into a system and there's all this cool graphics going on and stuff like that. Um, I wish. That would be so cool. And most of the time, when you're in the middle of programming, you've got this thing in your head. You've got this structure in your head. And you've got these tools. And you're, you're peeking into this thing. And you're trying to understand what it's going on. If you're writing code, it's one of those activities that you need to get into that particular headspace. And it's a beautiful place to be. It's, it's a, I find it very relaxing, where you've got all this stuff, you understand what's going on, and you write code and it works. It's just a wonderful place to be. If you're a programmer and you like that kind of thing, it's like writing a good short story or something, making something of your own creation while you're in the process of writing software, it's a wonderful exercise. It's a wonderful thing. But that's the problem. 
So we've got software. We've got a bunch of issues. It's complicated. It tends to be hard to see. It's hard to explain. So we've got a bunch of things we can do to help our sound. First of all, we take the pieces. We abstract them, if you will. We encapsulate them, if you will. We make them into chunks, and we ignore them for the rest of the time. We make subroutines. We make functions. We make objects. We use other people's code. We treat it all like black boxes. Another thing we do is we use tools that allow us to see into the software. Another thing we can do is we use diagramming techniques to understand the shape of the software. The first diagramming technique we're going to talk about is flowcharts. It's an old, old diagramming technique. I think it was invented in 1920-something, long before there were programmable calculators or but in that area when I talked about, you know, if you're talking to a marketing person and you want to explain to them, well, first this happens, then this happens, then I have to figure this out. Flowcharts, everybody understands immediately. So when you're sketching a problem to a person, flowcharts the way to go. So we'll do that next. 